then we might not have many texts left to teach, including texts written by the judges of the Supreme Court. So, so we, I think we should, we should, we should all agree that we read texts because these texts bring value to, to the classroom. They allow us to think through ideas in particular structured ways that other texts might not. So our selection of texts depends on that. So uh, I, I would not over-engage my students on what texts they select. I, I don't think it's a democratic decision in any case. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a curatorial choice. You, you select texts that have value for the class. The, the second thing I'd say about Schmidt and Kelsen in particular is that um, the reason we, we must read Schmidt today is not because we agree with him. So I don't see that, that the reason to engage a, a, a Schmittian text in the classroom is because we espouse his views. It, we must read him because he sounds terribly like something you might you might hear on 9 p.m. TV. <laughs> in this so the reason to read Schmidt is because, you know, people are mouthing Schmidt without having read him. Mm -hmm. So it, it helps us understand a way of thinking. And that's what uh, reading Schmidt uh, is useful for. And given that he had a formidable intellectual adversary in Kelsen, uh, who, who we may or may not read, but and we read Kelsen for the wrong reason, right? Everyone talks about Kelsen and the Grand Norm and his his theory of a pure science of 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 uh, a pure science of jurisprudence. But Kelsen was phenomenal on the question of politics and democracy, uh, which we don't read Kelsen. It's so that part of Kelsen is is really important. So uh, in any case, I don't see classrooms as having to kind of. We don't, we're not there to indoctrinate our students to this or that view. Uh, if we are there to educate, uh, if we put the text there and work with them, people will make up their own mind. Thank you. So, thanks, uh, And uh, I thank again Inuujis and the Honorable Vice Chancellor for making me part of this wonderful panel, instructive panel. Thank you, and this brings this session to a close. Thank you. Uh, no. Uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists for having contributed to a, an immensely rich discussion. I now uh, would like to request the Vice Chancellor to felicitate all the panelists. Thank you very much. Sir, it's too far, sir. It's too far.
people who are from english speaking tier 1 cities are joining these law schools that is the idea uh, behind idai and with, uh, that's that's the reason idai started diversity survey in for first year student uh, and it is in year 2020 is celebrating 20 years old so we thought of creating a similar kind of model for all five years uh, batches and 86% of ngs student filled this diversity report Uh, we involved all the stakeholders. We uh, sent a questionnaire to uh, faculty to get it re uh, review done, and 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 we are really happy that 544 responses out of uh, more uh, 625 students filled the report. The idea behind this diversity report was to see whether there is an equality of opportunity and equality of outcome in law school or not. Because generally we acknowledge the fact that privilege is an invisible, be it before coming to law school or joining after law school. So this report has three uh, three divisions. First one being demographics, second is performance at law school, and third life at MBS. In demographics, we mapped gender, caste, religion, sexual orientation, parental background, financial background, educational background, and linguistic background. In academics, we mapped extracurricular, publication, committees, academics, and uh, committees. So what kind of people are joining com uh, committees? What kind of people are performing well in academics? Uh, in life at at life at NLS, we are mapping mentorship program. How well it is functioning with respect to debate mentorship, voting mentorship, uh, and uh, overall general mentorship program. And we also map peer pressure, peer discrimination, and how inclusive law school and and NLS is particularly for different level, and how well we have dealt with mental health in last two and a half years. Uh, the uh, in in this process, we uh, realize that. Uh, there has to be some for, for taking taking an example of gender issue uh, in nijs we are facing the issue of gender issue uh, propo, uh, gen females coming in less proportion compared to male and uh, the response the response of female was uh, 2 is to 3 in nijs diversity report as well however females are performing ac academically really well but this is not a unidimensional thing because these females are coming from a uh, parental background whose finding uh, Parental income is much higher than male counterpart. But again, this is again not a single dimensional thing. The females are coming from tier one cities, and these uh, the primary reason can be the privilege uh, and the girls not being sent from towns and uh, towns and villages. And uh, now Siddharth will tell more on the aspect of uh, factual thing about diversity report. So essentially, we were uh, attempting to map. Uh, the background of the students, the demographics, uh, the, the, uh, where they come from, uh, and uh, trying to understand how how they they have experienced their lives at NUJS, how they have performed at NUJS. Uh, I'm going to just highlight few interesting inferences that we've come across uh, with respect to the demographic data that we've collected. Uh, for instance, out of 544 uh, respondents, 39.3%. Only identified as females, whereas 60% more than 60% identified as male. Uh, similarly, 89.3% uh, of the respondents identified as heterosexuals. Uh, the representation from uh, Northeast India, Jammu and Kashmir, Andhra Pradesh, and Telangana, Telangana seem to be scarce, whereas uh, states of West Bengal, Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, Maharashtra. Uh, uh, seem to share a greater representation. Uh, similarly, eight, more than 85 percent of the respondents uh, had parents, uh, both of whom were graduates, uh, and uh, a higher proportion of representation seemed to come from uh, Brahmins and other upper castes uh, in our university. Uh, uh, similarly, uh, we also try to understand how many students have uh, taken uh, educational loans uh, before joining NUJS. And the majority of students, 83.5%, had not dependent uh, depended on uh, any educational loan. Uh, we also mapped which schools they had come from, and uh, whether uh, uh, top private schools or government schools. And we realized that only 8% of the respondents out of 544 responses uh, had studied in government schools, whereas 48% of the responses uh, respondents had attended a top private school in India. And uh, 
La uh, lastly, uh, we also try to understand uh, uh, so respondents who identified as Brahmins are the upper caste or uh, who didn't want to identify with the caste also comprised about 90% of all those admitted under the general category. So these were certain interesting influences that we came across while we were conducting this study. And we thought we should highlight that here. Uh, to the entire general body who uh, helped us in this report and Professor Saurabh Bhattacharya Professor Richard Goswami and Professor Ankita Man who reviewed this questionnaire before we released our report. So thank you so much everyone for helping us out in this report. Uh, it's great that this kind of uh, initiative comes from the student body uh, because I think institutionally this kind of data gathering has been weak. Um, so let's move ahead. We are a little late for the panel. Um, all of 30 minutes late. So we, we'll try and um, finish up by 2 o'clock. So we have three speakers uh, and we've kind of agreed on an order of speakers. Uh, Alok will get us started um, and he wants to emphasize some broad themes in federalism as is evident in the, in the last decade or so. Shamik will go second and um, focus on some specific questions on, on, on federalism. Um, and uh, Orgo will go third and focus on the Article 370 question. So let's get started, Alok. Thank you. Sure, sure. I think you have to uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone at NGS for having uh, invited me to this event. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak here. Uh, without uh, any further ado, let me sort of go very broadly into the two themes that I intend to talk about uh, today. Um, I start with the premise that what we have is a two and a half tier of federalism. It's not just center versus state, uh, but we actually have center, state and local government. But uh, local government, unlike the state or the center, does not have its powers granted to it directly by the constitution. It is supposed to be devolved um, by the say, state through laws made in accordance with the 73rd and 74th amendment. So when I say local government, I of course mean the panchayati large institutions and the urban local bodies. And unlike uh, the states, they are creatures of statute. So uh, they're partially creatures of statute and partially creatures of the constitution as opposed to the states itself and the uh, union parliament which draw its powers from the constitution directly. Uh, while, so what, the tension that I'm really talking about is that uh, over the last decade, in fact over the last one and a half decades, what we have seen is a trend towards greater centralization in the sense of the center trying to claw back certain powers from the states but at the same time uh, states pulling back certain other powers in unexpected places from the center. Uh, this is a constant tension that we see in India but it's happening at both levels. We, have seen, we are seeing also that there is a demand to devolve more powers to local self-government, to uh, panchayati, panchayat bodies and urban local bodies and this is a debate that happens has happened say for those of you who have lived in Delhi about giving Delhi full status for those, those of you who have lived in Bangalore this is constantly about why should the state government run Bangalore and the variation of this debate also happens in the context of Mumbai in the context of Chennai and other major cities in India I don't want to go into the specifics of those particular debates as to rather to broadly lay out the contours of what is happening with Indian federalism uh, but, but one thing that I sort of want to start off is that the federalism that we have today was probably quite unimaginable for those who frame the constitution. If you see the debates uh, on, on the federal nature of India's constitution, and you will also see in the years immediately after a constitution was adopted, there's a sense that this is quasi-federal, that it's not really as federal, and the, the idea and image of federalism was in the context of the United States. There was, in light of partition rights, in light of the planned economy in light of the poverty, whatever else you want to take it, you find that there was an overwhelming desire felt that we have to empower the center more than the states. But what has happened over the next, uh, actually from the 70s onwards, is that states have slowly loosened the center's grip over uh, governance in India as such. What we find, and I think it's the more three things have sort of broadly contributed to it. One is that uh, states have been able to make better and more efficient use of their resources and to first make, be, be, have been better at raising resources and making more efficient use of them. You find that uh, in India not every state is equally dependent on the union's resources. So those of you who are familiar with our constitutional structure, 
Uh, the union is given the bulk of the taxing powers, states are given a few, um, but the union's taxes have to be shared with the state in accordance with the recommendations of the Finance Commission. Now, you would have seen in yesterday's news that the 15th Finance Commission has retained temporarily, at least for the first year, the same uh, re re proportion of revenue di distribution between the centre and the states, which means states get 42%, collectively get 42%, of the union's divisible pool of resources. But some states are far more dependent on the money that comes from this pool than other states. For example, a state like Telangana gets nearly 60 to 70 percent of its revenue on its own taxing powers, whereas a state like Bihar depends on the union for like about 90 percent of its revenues. This includes, for instance, uh, grants given out by the union under various schemes grants given in accordance, with the in accordance with the Finance Commission's report and so on. So we've seen that certain states are actually not that dependent. They may like the money, they may demand more money, but they're not that dependent on the union for mobilizing revenues and being able to spend them. A second thing, of course, is the growth of regionalist parties. Now, this is a category that has been, uh, that uh, K.K. Kailash, who's a political science scholar in the University of Central University of Hyderabad and a few others sort of talk about which is to say that we use the term regional parties very loosely, but there are in fact two kinds of regional parties. There are regional parties which geographically or politically are limited to a particular region, but there are regionalist parties whose ideology, whose reason for existence and whose core motivation is to put forth a regionalist agenda. So if I have to draw a distinction, um, the Telugu Desam party in uh, now, in, in what is now uh, Andhra, is a regionalist party, whereas um, something like the NCP is still a regional party. Right? It may be based only in Maharashtra, it may not have any serious presence outside Maharashtra, but it is a regional party. It does not put forth any identity beyond a specific caste identity of the Marathas. Uh, likewise, the AGP, Aswam Gana Parishad, is a regionalist party. Right? It is focused on Assam and the Assam is a region and the ethnic considerations there. But perhaps something like the TMC is more of a regional party trying to be a regionalist party. So these categories are somewhat fluid, one can move from the other. But parties which affect, which, uh, which you know, create, have this ideology and everything on the basis of linguist, on, on language and ethnicity on a particular region, those are regionalist parties and they having formed a greater part of the polity in India have influenced the shape of federalism, have clawed back certain kinds of powers. A third thing that has happened, and perhaps most of most interest, since this is mostly a room of lawyers, is how the Supreme Court's idea of federalism has changed. Now, this is something very interesting that has happened since the 80s. And you find that in terms of how the Supreme Court appreciates the powers, the division of powers between the center and the states, you find the Supreme Court tilting the balance towards the states much more since the mid 80s. Now, the exact causes of this need to be examined and need to be gone into, but <coughs> I just want to cite one example of illustrative of what I'm saying. You, we had this judgment of uh, the Jindal Stainless uh, Steel versus uh, State of uh, Haryana in 2016, which talked, which was in the context of entry tax, which was interpreting Article 304 which, uh, of the Constitution, which deals with freedom of trade and commerce. It's, I think, one of the most interesting nine judge best decisions that you will read, and unfortunately, even that entry tax itself is now subsumed under GST, uh, it's not so much part of the conversation. But if you compare it to the 50-year-old cases that were overturned in Jindal Stainless, you will find that the most pro-federal judge in, say, Atiyabari and Rajasthan voter, uh, which was, I think, Justice Subar, if I'm not mistaken, the one who is most in favor of states' powers, would actually be much more centrist than the most centrist judge in 2016. If you were to plot them on how they approach the interpretation of Article 304, about how they see the issue, how they perceive this uh, issue to be one between center and state, you will find that even the most um, centrist, if you want to call it, interpretation of Article 304 A and B, was perhaps much, much more pro-state than the most pro-state interpretation in the 1950s and 60s. And this is, you can you can find this in the context of the case of uh, S.R. Bomai as well, where the Supreme Court overturned its uh, precedent in the context of uh, President Zhu. So we are seeing, I, and I think this is something that is worth studying, but the courts have been in favor of expanding 
state, like uh, recognizing states as independent as entities in their own right and not just offshoots of the center or just you know implementing agencies of the center they have acknowledged that states have been given plenary legislative powers and effectively stand on the same footing uh, as the union it's just that the scope of the powers will be more limited geographically and the subject matters on which they exercise their power may be more limited than the union in some ways but beyond that they have made this jurisprudential leap of seeing the states at par with the union and not subordinate to it uh, but on that note i want to want to address two particular challenges uh, when it comes to um, federalism in india uh, i think all will be dealing with another one specifically but two very broad ones i want to highlight and we have seen this happen not just say in the last 5 years but in in one instance in the last from almost day 1 of the constitution and in the other in the last 5 years the first i want to talk about is the uh, post of the governor i think what we have seen is in most recent times the most blatant kinds of abuse of, of the office of the governor and let me be clear here in as much as i'm saying that it's an office that the abuse did not start in the last 5 years 10 years or 15 years in fact if you go back all the way to 1952 Uh, one of the first instances where the governor's position was abused was in the context of the state of madras where the then governor shri prakash had basically subverted all constitutional norms when relating to a parliamentary democracy to ensure that the congress uh, party which did not win a, a majority a simple majority in the elections did still end up forming the government with a person who did not even stand as a, as an mla being being nominated may being sworn in as a cm so it's not as if the post of governor has been has had a long history of very neutral and very impartial uh use of the office it has in fact had a long history of the exact abuse of this office but at this now i think it has now come to the point where we have to seriously reexamine one if we need the office at all uh, and two if we do in what manner so as to preserve the federal structure of the constitution rather than try and further damage it because what seems to be happening is that the office of the more as more and more people question whether we need an office of the governor and again keep in mind there are specific six scheduled concerns with the governor I'm not getting into that uh, in constitutionally we recognize that governors in non six scheduled states enjoy different powers than governors in six scheduled states so <laughs> there is that distinction also i'm talking about only governors in non six scheduled states there is an increasing debate as to whether we need this post at all and this is a tension which have to be resolved a second tension which has uh, arisen in actually in the last 12 months is the gst council itself now when the gst council was set up i had argued in a piece in nlsir that it is unconstitutional because it subordinates the state's legislative powers to the union's whims and fancies now even though the, in the gst council um all states can vote the weighting is not one state and one vote um it is in fact or rather one union slash state and one vote the union has a weightage of one third and the states together have a weightage of two third which means that the union can never find itself um uh, in a and of course any motion has to be carried with three fourths majority so simple mathematics would suggest that the union can never find itself in a minority even if all the other states gang up and say this is in our interest of course it doesn't mean that the union will necessarily have its say whatever motion it puts forth it still has to gain the support of a sufficient number of states but the union itself will never find itself in a in a minority if the states say this all this goes against our interests now this wasn't an issue for the first two years of the gst council's functioning but um, as of uh, december last year uh, the, the very first uh, it because mostly because all decisions were being taken by consensus Uh, all states there there was some effort being made at compromise and to create a consensus but for the first time we actually saw a vote in the gst council where uh, in the context of taxation of interstate lotteries some states wanted a higher rate some states wanted the lower rate and the lower rate prevailed clearly affecting the revenues of some states now what is not clear is what happens next are these dissenting states free to pass their own laws uh, having the, the change rates technically speaking the gst council only makes recommendations not binding directions but if the gst is to exist as a continuing universal one nation one tax it has to be treated as a binding direction if it is a binding direction what should the aggrieved states do now this is again not clear from the structure of the amendment which introduced the gst because the, it leaves it to the gst council itself to create some sort of a mechanism for dispute resolution Now it's not clear what does this dispute resolution consist of. Who will be on it? Is it retired judges? Is it sitting judges? 
Is it perhaps, can the GST council simply say, go file a suit under article 131 of the constitution of India? So a lot of these issues have been left open and this is a tension which is going to increase as we now find that the centre is not able to meet its obligations to the states to compensate them for loss of revenue. Forget that they are not even able to distribute the GST collected in time to the states as was promised. So we are going to see much more tensions uh, in the federal structure of the constitution as states grapple with the fact that their funds are drying up and this is mostly because the union is failing to do its job in transmitting the funds. Uh, yeah, the finance commission is something that I thought I'd just very briefly mention but uh, it's only for one year but this is again another tension where now the union is trying to suggest that uh, the state should contribute to defense, the state should contribute to the foreign uh, affairs issues. Uh, without sort of being willing to say that why should the union have anything to do with matters which are purely on the state list. We have a Depart Ministry of Agriculture at the centre, even though agriculture is a state subject. Now I can understand if there is a Ministry of Health which focuses on, you know, pay, uh, uh, on say drug testing which needs to apply across the country, but why is it that say a scheme uh, regarding health insurance or, or you know, primary health centres should be funded by the centre when this is really the responsibility of the state. So, I mean, there are, this, this particular tension is also going to arise as to what should be the legitimate area for the union to concern itself with, how should it use its money, and what should states be focusing on, and how should they use their money. Uh, finally, one, one last point that I sort of want to make uh, is in the sense that one of the things that our constitution has had no, has, does not think about at all is the idea of a city as a unit of governance. Now, we are finding, and demographics show, that India is probably going to cross the 50% uh, or rather uh, India is going to cross the threshold of having at least 50% of its population live in urban areas within the next decade if it hasn't already happened. Uh, those of you who are aware may know that we use one of the most restrictive definitions of what constitutes a city around the world. Uh, most other countries have very loose definitions and it crosses 50%. If we were to apply those definitions, economists estimate that India is anywhere between 45 to 70 percent urban. Assuming that has not already happened, uh, we are finding that more than 50 percent of uh, India is going to live in an urban space. But the constitution has no concept. Uh, the, the constitution's smallest unit of governance is the state, and it has no conception of what can a city. Well, what does a city do? And right, and it's very surprising because a lot of the people in the constituent assembly had experience, had political experience as mayors and councillors in various cities, but they never felt that somehow we should be talking about urban civic issues or rather the constitution should have anything to say about urban civic issues or even for that matter rural issues. Um, this, is, this, come, this comes to the fore in an issue something like for example, my favourite topic these days, Bangalore traffic, uh, in that uh, it's kind of absurd that metro, the, the metro in Bangalore, um, requires, it is under a central legislation, right? Um, which means that even if tomorrow uh, Bangalore wanted the metro to grow in a certain way because Bangalore has gone in a certain way, it can't decide that on its own. It has to be the state government sitting with the central government. Um, suburban rail, which I think, again, you would have read the note uh, with the announcement that center is giving this massive amount of money for suburban rail, but it seems, again, kind of absurd that rail, should, that suburban rail, it's again within the limits of a city, should be in the hands of the centre. Uh, repeatedly in conversations concerning say transportation, and I'm only taking just transportation, I'm not going into issues of pollution, I'm not going into issues of solid waste management, again and again you will keep running into this barrier that cities are unable to take decisions on their own simply because nobody thought that cities would have to grapple with these issues on their own and leaves everything to the state and the centre. So this is something that is going to be a demand, increasing demand as we go forward. The cities are going to say enough is enough. We don't want to have to run to the chief minister of our state. We don't want our chief minister to be the de facto mayor of the city. Uh, we don't want to have to run to the centre to get a policy on bicycle lanes approved. At some point, these will have to be issues taken at the local level. And when we say federalism, what we really need for India is a three-tier federalism where each tier focuses on the issues where it's most effective or efficient to address the needs of citizens rather than sticking to a very rigid constitutional idea of this should be the boundary of union powers and this should be the boundary of state powers. Uh, with that I'll end and we can carry this discussion on forward. Thank you. Things that one faces when one addresses a uh, conference of this nature in the home turf is that most of the audience have already heard what I have to say.
in course of class, right? So I have this additional challenge of saying something new, just to keep people engaged. And of course, the other difficulty is that you know I am probably the odd man out uh, in this you know illustrious panel. I somehow stick out as a little different. Um, facing these two challenges, I'll just try to keep my address really short, and uh, I'll try to focus on some very specific themes. Uh, which I think needs some consideration in light of the nature of federalism, especially that we see today. Of course, P Professor P.K. Tripathi had long back said that India has a mythical sense of federalism. Uh, those days, we were probably trying to envisage this myth in the form of, uh, you know, the center state legislative relations and how, you know, I don't need to repeat this, that uh, you have the predominance of the union list and there are so many other such principles plenary powers and all of that. So in that context, we had envisaged this myth to be. But these days, we find federalism facing two different strands of uh, independent action. One, where the center apparently bulldozes the will of the state and substitutes the will of the parliament as the will of the state and passes very important laws, including state reorganizations. On the other hand, you have a new evolving form of federal spirit when there is an act of defiance from the state against a law that is unanimously passed by the parliament. So much so that 131 has again become the buzzword. Now this newfound act of defiance and very active defiance when state assemblies are passing resolutions that we don't agree to a law that has been legislated upon by the center is probably federalism 2.0 that we can you know probably sense today. Now in this backdrop let me call the, you know, let me call this particular talk that I'm going to uh, deliver as, and with due apologies to Gabriel Garcia Marquez, federalism in the times of Modi. Uh, Mr. Modi uh, coined a very interesting term, competitive federalism. And suddenly competitive federalism became uh, one of the key words that the nine o'clock shows were, you know, badgering our ears with. Now, I was just reading a lecture that was delivered by Mr. Vijay Kelkar last year, the Shukumar Chakraborty Memorial Lecture, where Mr. Vijay Kelkar, uh, I don't need to tell, tell you who he is, such an eminent person, Mr. Vijay Kelkar made a very interesting observation. He says that, look, this competitive federalism doesn't work. Because in federal countries, usually the developmental imbalance, that's a coinage that he uses, which is basically the difference between the gross contributions to the national income, the average gross, average contributions per capita to the national income between the most developed states and the least developed states is in the range of about 2%, not more than 2%. But in India, this difference, this developmental imbalance is somewhat in the range of 6% and it's in fact higher than 6%. So in this paradigm, if we are talking about having a kind of a competition, then naturally this competition is going to be skewed. And if this competition is going to be skewed, competitive federalism as a concept would fail. Right? So keeping this, you know, idea, this lofty idea of competitive federalism in mind, I will focus on some specific themes as to why, you know, this, 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 this notion of this, you know, quasi-federal um, state with harmony and cooperation and some kind of a union predominance uh, is being put to newer challenges today. I find the challenges coming in two ways. One is of course a political challenge to the notion of federalism. We find the rise of political monoliths and by political monoliths I don't mean a single party or a single figure. I'm also trying to locate and Alok had very rightly pointed out that there are parties which are regional and regionalists. But as we see in the contemporary times, both the regional and the regionalist parties seem to be on the wane. I ascribe this waning partially to, um, you know, the gradual shifting away from dominance of, you know, the charismatic central figures of those regionalist groups. You know, Mr. Karnanidhi is no more. Of course, Mr. Stalin is doing some work, but then, of course, Mr. Karnanidhi's teacher was much bigger. Janilka is no more. Uh, there are other political parties which are not, you know, which are facing existential crisis. For example, in UP. Uh, 
other other political parties which are which are charisma driven are so much charisma driven that you just remove that charismatic figure from the picture you find that they are in doldrums so just 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 imagine a trinamool congress without mohan banerji you will understand what the problem is so naturally when you know the regional or regionalist parties seem to face this existential crisis the larger monoliths seem to be on the rise and the moment the larger monoliths are on the rise the federal argument seems to be you know uh, you know a, 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 a lot compromised the other problem with the federal um, you know dialogue is institutional look at what we have done to institutions i will take a specific example of the rajya sabha the rajya sabha was envisaged with the council of states for all the right reasons in the constituent assembly you had people like kt shah and people like loknath mishra who had said that the rajya sabha should you know should form a structure like the you know like like the, like the american senate that every state should have equal representation in the rajya sabha because the rajya sabha is a council of states and that nature of it, the rajya sabha being the council of states needs to be preserved now in 2003 what you have done is you have very surreptitiously removed the domicile requirement for contesting in the rajya sabha election so technically for all the 250 seats in the rajya sabha as in there are 238 and 12 nominated seats so collectively 250 you can have all 250 coming from delhi because we have removed the domicile requirement and we have done nothing with with it mr kuldeep nair of course raised a huge even cry he went and filed a petition in the supreme court supreme court rejected it so the domicile removal has stayed on so what has therefore happened is that the rajya sabha can potentially become a very very homogeneous entity just now we were talking about diversity the value for diversity has been taken away from the rajya sabha which was ostensibly looked at as a federal representative and therefore what has happened there you know as a result is that on issues of national interest you know article 249 says that if the rajya sabha with a two thirds majority decides that a certain subject matter in the state list has assumed <coughs> national interest the parliament can legislate on that subject matter it's a temporary thing but still you know it the legislation can happen so 250 people sitting in delhi will decide whether a particular thing that has happened in assam has suddenly acquired national interest and at least for a period of 6 months to a year this law can survive and the rights and the duties that this law puts on people can survive so again i find an institutional compromise on federalism in doing away with the importance as that was ascribed to the rajya sabha and in any in any case what do we need the rajya sabha we have the money bill route so for every other thing that the rajya sabha tends to pose a problem pass money bills right so that's an institutional crisis that uh, i would um, you know say federalism faces today another issue that i would like to highlight here in the federal context is the ambit of article 355 whenever we talk about federalism we usually talk about 356 in the uh, you know in the context of center state relations but come to think of it article 355 which says that it shall be the duty of the union to protect the states against external aggression and you know internal disturbances it shall be a duty now you know uh, the typical hofeldian right you know co correlatives duty is the opposite of duty the correlative of duty is rights Now, is it a fundamental right to be protected against external aggression and internal disturbance? No. At best, we can say it's a constitutional right, much like the right to vote that was held to be constitutional right by, you know, in the Rajwala case. It's a constitutional right. Now, if we consider that it is a constitutional right to be protected, and the correlative, the opposite is that it's the state's duty to protect state. You know, it's a it's the union's duty to protect states against external disturbance and uh, internal external aggression and internal disturbance. then even a minor failure of the state to per perform that ostensible duty is looked at as a huge constitutional transgression i am referring to the sarbanand sonowal case when particular sections of the imdt act were struck down and it was said by justice mathur that it is struck down because it violates article 355 the census the center has not been able to live up to its constitutional duty what justice mathur is indicating is that the center will have to now go out of its ways to perform its duties lest it's pulled up by the supreme court and 
the center's performance of its duties would essentially entail the center giving strict mandates to the state that you do A, B, C, D, E. The center will do it out of an existential concern. Because if the center does not give these instructions, then it might just be hauled up. Laws might just be struck down. In fact, something that we even don't do in fundamental rights, that you know there are, there, there are cases which say that of course, right to water, right to access to clean water is a part of right to uh, life and personal liberty. But then the state has come in with an affidavit saying that, you know, we have only been able to achieve up to this much. So people say, okay, you have at least right. But here, there is no scope. You have to absolutely perform your duties. So the center will in turn absolutely order around the states, say that you do A, B, C, D, E. If you don't do it, you know, we are your boss. There is this, this inherent fear why they are asserting this supremacy is that you know, there is inherent fear that if we don't order you around and if we don't make you fall in line, then we will probably be holding the Supreme Court. And we don't want to come across as you know, a, a, a body that does not perform our duties. So Article 355, in my opinion, again, is a huge challenge to the entire federalist discourse. Uh, finally, and again something that Alok has very rightly mentioned, the role of the government. Now I don't, you know, need to mention, especially here in West Bengal, the crisis that you know the office of the governor uh, has has facing and is making the government face. Uh, but and of course, also in any case. Uh, but then again, come to think of it, this is about institutional accountabilities, and it's not just about the office of the governor. The office of the governor is looked at as a kind of a political office. Probably it always was. These days, the political nature of the office has been highlighted even more. But I think, in, as in, again, this is something that I um, tend to um, observe, that these days, almost all offices which had a semblance of neutrality associated with them have become political offices. For example, the office of the speaker. You know, I, I recollect Shumna Chatterjee going against his party mandate and saying something that, you know, the, the dignity of his office entails. But these days, if you look at simply, you know, the anti-defection proceedings, that there are, you know, there are people who routinely cross flows, cross, you know, they cross over to a different political party. Typically, they would be, you know, their, 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 their membership will be disqualified because they will fall within the anti-defection net. When the complaints are made to the speaker, the speaker takes an enormous amount of time and does not decide. By the time the speaker is in a position to even come to a conclusion on whether this person has actually defected, when it's an open and shut case, probably it's time for the next election. Just recently I saw that the Supreme Court has given an order, I think, in the case of Mizoram. No, in the case of Manipur. Manipur, I'm sorry. Manipur. That, you know, this, this has to be decided within a, uh, four, weeks. four weeks. So it's, it's a very welcome development. But where is the Supreme Court coming from? The Supreme Court is coming from <coughs> an, an experience that these offices, which are ostensibly neutral offices of governance, are becoming political every day. So, so is the office of the governor. So let's not single out the governor and say that, you know, this is where uh, there is political dominance, this political dominance or this political nature of important offices of prestige is happening at every stage. And all these things collectively are challenges to whatever form of federalism we have. Even if we have a mythical sense of federalism, even if we are quasi-federal, still at least a semblance of this balance is something which is integral to our constitution's survival and this country's development. So on that note, I don't have a solution to offer. The beauty about academic conferences is that you don't have to come with solutions. I'm just, I just flagged a few concerns and I'm sure, you know, uh, in course of discussion, we'll probably try to evolve a solution. Thank you. Thanks, Shami. In Kolkata and particularly in NUJS, uh, and especially uh, in a session that's uh, in remembrance of Professor Madhav Menon, who uh, was the reason as to why many of us are in law school in the first place. So uh, Alok and Shamik had pointed out two uh, broad overviews of the challenges to federalism that the country currently faces. Uh, I'm going to do a deep dive into one particular challenge that is Article 370 uh, and try and uh, construct an argument 
uh, as to why there is a basic core of Article 370 that cannot be amended. Now this comes out of uh, a set of seminars that Justice Rumapal, Justice Chalameshwar and I took at NUJ. So I am delighted that I could try this experiment of this argument out here. In the Supreme Court over the last few weeks, the question of Article 370 has been litigated and most of the constitutional issues pertain to whether there is a basic, whether the basic structure doctrine which includes federalism is being, has been violated with uh, the parliament exercising the powers of the uh, state legislature which in turn is exercising the powers of the constituent assembly. That is not what I am going to speak about today. I am going to talk about is there a basic core of article 370 itself which cannot be amended irrespective of what the procedure that is followed. So it's a slightly different argument. Uh, in the interest of time I won't go over the factual narrative of what happened on the 5th of August. We all know uh, that the parliament uh, essentially did a combination of three things that it took away, it uh, nullified article 370. It uh, passed a resolution recommending that the state of Jammu and Kashmir be split and then split the state. So what I'm going to do in this talk is that I'm going to provide a clear exposition of the design of Article 370 at the time of its drafting and understanding <coughs> of the purposes behind its enactment and some substantive limitations on the power to amend Article 370 irrespective of the procedure that is followed. Now to understand the genesis of Article 370, we need to look at the terms of Jammu and Kashmir's accession to India. It's classically seen as a case of asymmetric federalism, but I think there is a lot more going on than simply asymmetry. In 1947, as the ruler of a large princely state which comprised Jammu, the Kashmir Valley, Ladakh and Gilgit Baltistan, which was actually leased to the government of India for 60 years, Maharaja Hari Singh harbored dreams of an independent Jammu and Kashmir. He said that he wanted to make it a Switzerland of the East. Uh, as a consequence, when there was partition and independence of India and Pakistan, Hari Singh acceded to neither state. However, when a state came under attack from uh, what he called Afridi's soldiers in plain clothes and desperados, which was in October 1947, the Maharaja said that he had no option but to ask for help from the Indian Dominion. Since this was not possible without accession, on 26th of October, the Maharaja signed an instrument of accession, becoming a part of India. As part of this accession, it ceded jurisdiction to the government of India on only three matters relating to defense, external affairs and communications. Please note that this instrument of accession was exactly the same as every other instrument entered by every other princely state with India. It was exactly the same. In clause 8, it provided that nothing in this instrument affects the continuance of my sovereignty in and over this state. And there's something else, but basically there was some retention of sovereignty. So JNK, like every other state in India, had, which had acceded to India, retained its sovereignty except in relation to the three matters of foreign affairs, defense and communications. Mountbatten, who was then the governor general, in view of the urgency of the situation, accepted the accession. And he said that in any state where accession is the subject of dispute, the question would have to be decided ultimately in accordance with, and I quote, the wishes of the people of the state. Thus Mountbatten gave an assurance on behalf of the government of India that as soon as law and order have been restored in Kashmir and her soil cleared of the invader, accession would be determined by a reference to the people. This reference to the people was a formal policy of the government of India which it had followed in regard, with regard to other princely states as well. Now, in the absence of elections, there was at that point of time, uh, the prime minister in the state, was, at that point of time there was a Praja Sabha which was not a fully elected body. But in 1948, Sheikh Abdullah was appointed as Prime Minister of Jammu and Kashmir and in deference to his wishes taken in the absence of elections as representative of the popular will, JMK unlike other states did not sign a second instrument of accession. Other states all signed a second instrument of accession which allowed the Union of India to legislate on all matters relating to list one as we know it today and also cancelled the first instrument of accession. 
From this it can be inferred that J and K by not signing the second instrument, unlike other princely states, still retained a vestige of sovereignty despite being part of India. Now this state of affairs was with the full knowledge and acquiescence of the government of India. In view of this distinction between JNK and other princely states, coupled with a lack of consensus as to what is to be done, because at that point of time it's very curious what's happening in JNK is an internecine fight between the Maharaja on the one hand and Abdullah on the other. So primarily their primary concern, Abdullah's concern is to remove the monarchy and the monarchy's concern is to stay on in power. Uh, if you see all the letters at that point, they are very rarely talking about the constitutional relationship. So what happens is that in 1949, hurriedly, in October of 1949, one month before the constitution <coughs> was enacted, an interim provision, draft article 306A, is moved by N. Gopal Swami Ayanga, which is essentially the precursor to article 370. It is well recognized that this is an interim provision because the Union of India and the state of JNK have not been able to agree as to what the constitutional relationship between the two should be. Now, evidence of this, the fact that it continued, JNK continued to remain distinct, is provided by the proclamation that the state of JNK makes. Every princely state makes a proclamation. And if I were to read from another proclamation, Rajasthan, which was a group of princely states, said that the constitution of India, shortly to be adopted by the constituent assembly, shall be the constitution for the Rajasthan state as for the other parts of India. This is the proclamation that Rajasthan and all other princely states enter. What does JNK's proclamation say? It says that the constitution of India, shortly to be adopted by the Constituent Assembly of India, shall, insofar as it is applicable to the state of Jammu and Kashmir, govern the constitutional relationship between this state and the contemplated Union of India. So there are two key distinctions. The first is that they don't accept the constitution as their own, but say that this will only govern the constitutional relationship between JNK and India. Number two, they say the constitution of India as applicable to JNK, which means that the only provision that the Jammu and Kashmir government accepts is Article 370. It doesn't accept anything else. Now, if we look at the schema of Article 370, there are four parts of Article 370 with one key overriding condition. The overriding condition is that it starts with the words notwithstanding anything provided in the constitution. So it is in some sense a self-contained code. And what's interesting to note, which is very rare in a constitutional provision, that Article 1, which says that India shall be a union of states and there's a schedule which Jammu and Kashmir is a part of, and Article 370, apply as a consequence of article 370 so article 371c says that article 1 and article 370 shall apply as a consequence of this article so these are the only two provisions that apply in proprio vigore okay that's number one number two it says that article 238 which was a provision that applied to all other part b states does not apply to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. So other princely states had provisions for Raj Pramukhs. This was to accommodate the princes as governors, but that didn't apply to Jammu and Kashmir. So even amongst other princely states, it was in a league of its own. Third, there is what it does is that it fleshes out the instrument of accession. The instrument of accession has said that there are three matters, foreign affairs, defense and communications, where the union will be competent to legislate. Article 370 gives the power to the president to determine that what are the exact laws in the list which are in consonance of these three matters and that has to be determined in consultation with the people of the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Okay, And the fourth thing, I'm going to cut out some of the details in the interest of time so that we can have some discussion. And the fourth is that this entire arrangement would persist until Article 370 continued. So its demise was specifically envisaged in subsection 3. This subsection vested the power in the president by public notification to declare that the article shall cease to be operative or operate with exceptions and modifications as may be specified. 
it was mandated that a recommendation of the constituent assembly of JNK would be necessary before such a notification can be issued. This means that the scheme of Article 370 is temporary till the time, and this is the important bit, it's not just temporary as the political discourse would have it, it's temporary till the time that the people of JNK through the constituent assembly make a recommendation to the president to modify or seize its operation. So whether it be the continuance of 370, whether it be the application of matters relating to foreign affairs, defense and communications, or other matters which are not in the instrument of accession, in each of these you need to have both the assent of the people of Jammu and Kashmir and the people of India. So essentially, if there is a basic feature, as I argue in this article, to Article 370, the basic feature of Article 370 is that it takes two hands to clap. No unilateral action is permissible. Now, I'm not going to go into the Article 356 question as to whether this action could be taken by, by Parliament. I'm going to make a slightly different argument from Minerva Mills and its understanding of limited amendability of the Constitution. So in Minerva Mills, the Supreme Court accepted the argument, as we all know, that limited amending power of Parliament is part of the basic structure of the Constitution. You'd remember that Article 368, 4 and 5 had been introduced, which had said that the uh, that Parliament's power to amend the Constitution is unlimited. Striking this down, just as Bhagwati had said in his concurring opinion, that the amendments sought to convert a controlled Constitution into an uncontrolled one. The same logic, it's my submission, must apply to Article 370. Article 370 1D gives the power to the President, along with the representatives of JNK, to modify or exempt the application of the provisions of the constitution. Similarly, Article 370 sub clause 3 provides the power to the president along with the constituent assembly of JNK to modify or cease to keep Article 370 itself operative. I am not getting into the question of modification versus amend, but let us be certain of one point that Article 368 and the normal procedures of amendment were not meant to apply to 370 because 370 had its own procedures for amendment. The question that arises, however, is if it is so limited, what is it limited by? 